Hello and welcome everyone to the United Suicide Survivors International Webinar, When It's Darkness, Making Sense of Suicide with our esteemed guest, Professor Rory O'Connor. I am Sally Spencer Thomas. I am a psychologist by training and also a survivor of suicide loss. I lost my brother to suicide in 2004. And that has led me on a pathway to really value uh, the voices of lived exp experience and living experience and to um, leverage these expertise to, for systems and cultural change. Um, let me turn it over now to our board member, um, Vic Armstrong. Hello everyone, I am Vic Armstrong. I am director of the North Carolina Division of Mental Health Developmental Disabilities and Substance Abuse Services and also a board member of United Survivors. And um, I'm very thrilled to have you all with us this afternoon. United, United Survivors uh, International is an independent global organization that serves as a home for people who have experienced suicide loss, suicide attempts, and suicidal thoughts and feelings and their friends and family, families. Our, our mission uh, is to cultivate the lived ex expertise of suicide into action through leadership, collaboration, and advocacy with the vision uh, of envisioning a world where lived expertise becomes the fulcrum that leverages all suicide prevention efforts. And our complete vision is to see a day when we are no longer needed because that voice of lived experiences is, is elevated and utilized. So again, thank you all so much uh, for being with us. And uh, I will turn it back over to Sally. Thanks, Vic. Uh, and thanks for your, your service to this uh, organization. Rosie, can you walk us through the housekeeping? Absolutely. Good morning to some, good afternoon to others. Thank you for joining us. Just a few housekeeping items. We will be recording today's webinar, so you'll be able to check it out after we conclude on our website at unitesurvivors.org, as well as our YouTube channel, which is at Unite Survivors. We'll be taking questions and have an opportunity to ask uh, Professor Rory O'Connor some questions at the end of the webinar. We'll leave about 10 minutes for that. So be sure to include any questions or comments as they come up in the chat. If you're joining us from Facebook Live, um, be sure to share any questions, comments, and reactions there as well. Every month we have a webinar um, and Dr. Spencer Thomas will be introducing our next one at the conclusion of today's. Excellent. Okay, Roy, go ahead and share your slide deck. Um, it is uh, my honor and pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest, uh, P Professor Rory O'Connor, um, who I've known for quite some time. I think I may have met you at the first International Association of Suicide Prevention's World Congress, perhaps in Killarney back in 2007, maybe. That was my first anyways. And yeah, anyway, yeah. yeah, probably. Hold on, sorry, Sally, one second. Vic, can you stop sharing your screen so I can share, yes, please? Yes, I got it. Fab, thanks. Sorry, Sally. No problem. <clears throat> Um, and uh, just have been a, a, a big fan ever since. Um, so Rory O'Connor is the professor of health psychology at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Um, he's also the president of the International Association for Suicide Prevention and a past president of the International Academy of Suicide Research. Rory leads the Suicidal Behavior Research Laboratory, which we'll hear more about um, at Glasgow and is one of the leading suicide and self-harm research mm. groups internationally. He's also the co-author and editor of several books, including his most recent book that came out earlier this summer, When It Is Dark Darkest, Why People Die by Suicide and What We Can Do to Prevent It. Um, he's also the co-editor in chief of the Archives of Suicide Research and the associate editor of Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior. And I'm very excited about this book. It's a very much a hot topic in the community of suicidologists. Um, and really, we'll be talking today about how suicide is pain um, and hopefully hearing more about the integrated volitional model that, uh, that Rory has developed, um, as well as, as the really important conversation about crossing the precipice from thoughts to action, and really importantly, how to help people impacted by suicide. Um, so Rory, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Sally, and many thanks for your kind invitation and introduction. Yes, I think Killarney, you're right, it was 2007, uh, some time ago. Um, 
Okay, so what I'm going to try and do over the next 45 minutes is really talk you through a bit of my journey in suicide research, what led me to um, write the book When It's Darkest, which um, Sally mentioned was published in, in the UK in May and, and of this year. It is available in the United States as well. Um, so, because I think it's important, I suppose, to me as a researcher to recognise what my own experiences, my own mental health, my own experiences of bereavement, what they, what they have obviously how they've impacted me and what that has sort of informed and how that has informed my own thinking so to do that uh really this journey so far because it's hard well i find it hard to believe that this is my 25th year working in the field of suicide research and, and suicide prevention so i think it is a time a, an opportune time to sort of reflect and so in this sort of reflections, if we think back to my sort of some of my key milestones in my career, so it all began, as you'll see in a second, in 1973, and then right up, I'll take you through some of the key milestones up until 2021 with the publication of When It's Darkest. So if I just maybe just hone in on that first milestone of obviously I was born and Many people in the field know that I have an identical twin brother and we actually collaborate in research. And I'll talk about some of our collaborative research here, but this is Daryl and I obviously being angelic, um, clearly. Um, but obviously being a twin is a very, very important part of my identity. And I think when we're thinking about understanding suicide risk, we have to understand the broader identity and take of individuals and also take a sort of developmental perspective. And then if I move on then from that's when I obviously was born, in terms of my suicide sort of research career, I think the, net, the, sort of the milestone for me, I suppose, is uh, 1997. So I'm from Northern Ireland, a uh, place Derry in the very north of Ireland, which had the pleasure of um, having Vic and Sally actually at the, uh, the International Congress of Suicide Prevention, which we organized in Derry in, just before the pandemic in 2019. But in, in 1997, I completed my PhD, and this is obviously what I used to look like when I had um, didn't have grey hair. But the, the, in, in my sort of reflections, I've been doing research on suicide, specifically on suicide, since 1994, and, and then I got my PhD in 1997. And as you can see by the title, Suicide and Parasuicide Aspects of Identification and Prevention. But even that title of the of my PhD illustrates a, 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 a marked change or something we need to be very conscious of. And something I do touch on in the book is, is the importance of language and how we talk and communicate about suicide and suicidal behaviors. And indeed, when I started out in the field in the mid 1990s, <clears throat> parasuicide was the, was the common term to describe any form of self-injurious behavior or so um, those of you obviously who are active in the field will know that we've now um, moved forward forward in that. There's different ways in which we conceptualize suicidal behaviors in the United States versus Europe, for example. So there's a self-harm we often use in, in the UK and Europe as a term to describe um, self-injured behaviors. And then we might qualify it with whether there was suicidal intent present or not. But in the United States, there is this clear dichotomy between non-suicidal self-injury and suicide attempts. And that's just one illustration, I think, of the complexity of trying to challenge and understand this, this phenomenon of suicidal behaviours of all, all, all types, but ultimately, sadly, those of who will die by suicide, who die by suicide. So in terms of moving on to the sort of next milestone after my PhD was, but before I do, one of the things I did when I was PhD was I went to the very last page of my PhD. And you'll see how this sort of, sort of evolves in terms of my thinking around when I go right to the book, when it's darkest is. So in 1997, I think in the last paragraph of my PhD, I conclude that we cannot predict with much accuracy who will attempt suicide or when. Therefore, it's essential that we continue to develop integrated multivariate psychological, psychosocial and clinical profiles of at-risk individuals. And I suppose what's really noteworthy about that quote is I could write that quote today. And so although I think, uh, uh, hopefully you'll agree by the end of the 45 minutes, we have made some advances in understanding suicide risk and making sense of suicide. 
We have still so many unanswered questions. And we know that our ability to predict suicide sadly remains no better than chance. But again, moving a couple of years on, three years on from my PhD, I published my first book, which was uh, co-written with my PhD supervisor, Noel Sheehy. And then that book was my first attempt to try and sort of conceptualize a psychological model of suicidal behavior. And again, don't worry about the details, but, uh, but to my mind, my thinking was, yes, recognizing that we had some understanding of the broad risk factors around suicide. So for example, we know mental illness or mental health problems of many different stripes are associated with suicide risk, but that doesn't help us understand which individual who's suffering from depression is more likely to end their life than others. And I often cite the statistic that we know that of all the people treated in hospital for depression, less than 5% will die by suicide. So the ultimate question that we're all grappling with in the suicide prevention field is to get a better understanding to better identify those, those 5% so we can then hopefully intervene and protect and support. And the other thing, I mean, when I come up with this sort of framework -y psychological model in 2000, I didn't then obviously then appreciate that many years later in 2011, or 11 years later, I would then obviously publish the IMV model or the integrated motivational volitional model, which will form the basis for much of the, the talk today. But again, I look to the end of that book in 2000, I, my conclusion there, Noel and I's conclusion is, we're still a long way off from understanding fully why people kill themselves. And again, the same point as I made in 1997, quote is we could be making the same statement today. And I mean, that's a sad reflection and illustrates the challenge we face. So then we fast forward then to 2008. And I guess to my mind, when I think about the impacts on my career, um, that was my first, um, sadly, my first experience of being directly bereaved by suicide when a very close friend of mine, Claire, took her own life. And 2008 was a really um, momentous year for me. I, I was made full professor. My son was born and Claire died by suicide. So it was really was a, a year of of highs and lows. And, and, I, and I write a lot about Claire in the book, When It's Darkest, in which I talk about my own guilt and my own reflections on how it changed me as a person. And although I've always been incredibly passionate about suicide prevention ever since that first day in uh, 1994, uh, when I started my work on my PhD on suicide and self-harm, but that, that first bereavement, um, well, it, it devastated me and, and, st and still remain devastated by Claire's death. But uh, in terms of its influence on me as an individual and as a researcher, um, I, I can't overstate it. And then sadly, when I move on into the next milestone, which is 2011, was my next um, experience or, uh, of direct experience of suicide when the man who brought me into the field of, of suicide research, Noel, uh, my first, my PhD supervisor, my mentor, took his own life. And, and again, when I think about the momentous influence on me, of him on me, I would never, I don't think, have entered the field of suicide research or suicide prevention if it wasn't for him. He came to me, as this, I mean, as it says in this quote, I put in a dedication to the International Handbook of Suicide Prevention, um, that, that I, I had no intention of doing a PhD on suicide. My plan on my PhD was to do to extend some of my undergraduate work into um, looking on, dep at the, on depression and look more on the sort of psychophysiology of depression. And then it wasn't for this call, this phone call I got from Noel in uh, that summer of 94, I think my, my career, my path may have gone very, gone very differently. Um, so incredibly grateful and um, to his influence, but again, both bereavements, in particular Claire's bereavement, I didn't know if I was going to be able to continue working in the field because as somebody who works every single day on suicide, I didn't know if I could bear the pain of that every day. But I'm so grateful that I was able to work through that and have stayed in the field. OK, so then moving on then to another milestone is, is basically then in 2011, I edited, co-edited the International Handbook, the first edition of the International Handbook of Suicide Prevention. 
and that's a, a milestone for me in my career and thinking about its pathway to the when it's darkest is because it's within it was in uh, 2011 in that handbook I first published the integrated motivational volitional model and that was really on the back of we had signed the contract to deliver this handbook was based initially on people who a collection of, of, of chapters from people who presented at the European Symposium on suicide and suicidal behavior, which I organized in Glasgow in 2018 with Steve Platt and Jackie Gordon. So, and when we signed the contract, I just quickly had put myself down to do a chapter on the psychology of suicide. And so really, and I talk about this in When It's Darkest, then a few weeks before submission, I was, I was going, I still hadn't done my own chapter. I was so busy looking at the other chapters. And anyway, out of that sort of need to deliver, I then um, I came up with the IMV model, which that's, was something I had been thinking about, but it gave me the incentive to, um, to, put the, to, to write the, the model up. And I'll come back to the IMV shortly. And then obviously in 2016, we published the second edition of the International Handbook of Suicide Prevention. So that brings us then almost up to date then to 2021. And so probably since that publication of the International Handbook, the second edition in 2016, I have been really grappling and thinking about this idea of writing a, a popular science book on suicide, a book which would be accessible to people who don't read academic papers, a book that would, be, would speak to those who have been suicidal themselves, speak to those who had uh, recovered from obviously a suicide attempt or were supporting people who were suicidal, as well as sadly those bereaved by suicide. And, but I really couldn't think of a way, way forward. And again, as I discussed in the book, after grappling with this sort of, this sort of idea in my head for a long time, I, was, I really couldn't get over this barrier that I wanted to do something that disseminated the sort of key evidence and knowledge and got the sort of tried to dispel many of the myths around suicide, but wanted it to be personal and speak of my own experiences as well as professional and speaking of the research evidence and practice and policy. But then on holiday um, and just before the year before the pandemic in the summer of, of, of 2018, uh, the, the basically, uh, yeah, that summer, I was on holiday with my family and I just had this eureka moment one night I was unable to sleep and I could see a way forward and then um, and then just a series of events happened that when I, I got home from holiday to find an email from what turned out to be my publisher somebody asking would I write a book on exactly what I'm planning to in a way I was planning to so it's just it's so in my mind so funny how these things came together and then, obviously, a couple of years later, after we'd signed the contract, I signed the contract for the book just as the pandemic lockdown was happening in March 2020 in the UK. And then, obviously, it came out last uh, or, or earlier this year in May 2021. So with that sort of brief overview, then what I try to do and what I'm trying to do with the book is to combine the personal and the professional by telling something of people's stories, and including my own, and really trying to con convey what I've learned both from my research and my life into obviously this most devastating of phenomena. And, and really what I've, I've made, I wanted to find that balance of giving a voice to people who have been suicidal and a voice for people who've, been, who've lost loved ones to suicide. And that's really what I've tried to do. So in sort of one line to, just, to summarize when it's darkest is, it is my journey so far through research uh, into suicide. So if, if those of you who, who haven't seen the book yet, it covers four broad parts, as you can see outlined here, and I'm not going to through, go through every part in detail here, but just to give you a sense of what the book's covering. So it's trying to really, as this, well, this talk is doing, is making sense of suicide, dispelling myths and misunderstandings, as well as thinking about what the evidence is in, in terms of, in particular, the psychological evidence and psychosocial evidence, both for longer term, and briefer interventions, which we know may be effective in reducing suicide risk, but also really challenging and supporting and acting as a guide and support for people who want to ask those difficult questions that we all, in the field of suicide prevention, we're always saying, please reach out, 
for help, please ask somebody whether they're suicidal. And I provide some guidance and support on how we might do that, as well as end, as I do today in this talk, I'll end with some discussion on obviously the, being bereaved by suicide. Okay, so that's a sort of um, broad overview of the book. And as I say, in the United States, it's available, I think, on Amazon and on the book depository. And the book depository, I know this audience is more than just the United States, um, is free to liberate anywhere in the world. Okay, so bringing me bringing us back then with that sort of sort of extended introduction, which I think is important, certainly for me as as I navigate my continued journey in suicide research. I'll just move on now to a bit about the scale of the challenge we face. I'll touch briefly on a couple of the myths which I touch on in detail in the book, and then I'll go specifically into the IMV model, some of the research we've been doing in different aspects of the AMV model. And then, as I say, move then out from what, away from the sort of research to warning signs, and then just some thoughts on supporting those who are bereaved based on what we think is, is obviously best practice. And I know many people in the audience either watching this live on Facebook or on, um, on this webinar or beyond will have been bereaved by suicide. Um, so, so please take care, I, I suppose, is my message of um, when you're, what, as we go through this. So much of the work I'll describe from my own personal work is directed, it comes from the Suicidal Behaviour Research Laboratory, which I lead at the University of Glasgow. And my work is, is all in collaboration with many colleagues uh, across um, different disciplines, people with lived experience. So we're all well aware, I think, of the stark reality that um, suicide is a major public health concern. There's different ways in which we can try and estimate the rates of suicide and the impact. And the most recent data from the World Health Organization suggests that about at least 703,000 people die by, die by suicide each year. And without question, that's an underestimate. And we know in, in, um, in countries, if we look over the last five years in particular, or 10 years, countries like the United States, countries like the United Kingdom, countries like Australia, we've seen this increase in suicides more broadly. Um, and, uh, and that's a concerning increase. Obviously, every single death is a tragedy. But when the, when the trend is going in the, in the wrong direction, it really highlights the need for more prioritization, more resources and more support. But then if you look at the sort of ripples of suicide, I always draw on Julie Carell's work and Julie's great work on looking at bereavement by suicide. And Julie's dispelling of the, what used to be this, well known as this fact, this fact in suicide research that for every person who died by suicide, six people were affected. And our understanding is that was obviously Ed Schneidman's statistic, and I think it was more anecdotal rather than evidence-based. And then what Julie and colleagues have done since that is obviously estimate that it's based on obviously survey-based work. We, we now accept Julie's figure of about 135 people will be in some way, some way affected by every one of those deaths by suicide. So then if you think about 703,000 deaths globally, that means annually we have something like 95 million people potentially affected or knew the person who's bereaved. And that's not to say that every one of those 95 million, of course, are obviously directly bereaved by suicide, but they could be potentially affected. So really important to think of those ripples of suicide and the devastation left behind. And then if you just go back to those who die by suicide, again, there's different ways in which we can highlight the scale of the challenges. One death every 40 seconds, and at least 20 more people will have attempted suicide. And obviously every country has different national rates, but the challenge in, 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 in certainly in Western countries is, is vast, is absolutely vast. And part of that challenge then, in our understanding and our prediction is, is that challenge of complexity. If we already understand suicide risk, we have to understand that there's no one single factor that leads to suicide. And that suicide is genuinely a biopsychosocial phenomenon. And this, this sort of framework model that uh, we published in 2019, led by Gustavo Turecki in, uh, in, in McGill in, in Montreal, 
highlights that range of factors from early life adversity and trauma, which I'll come back to later in the talk, to obviously looking at genetic influences. So we know that if you experience early life trauma, there's some evidence of changes in, in gene, gene expression, which can convey vulnerability. So the message is not that genetics lead to suicide, but they can convey vulnerability to mental health problems. And that vulnerability, when there's this perfect storm of factors, which is illustrated in this model going from broad social context and social context can mean very different things. It could be economic turmoil or, and that's a concern obviously, as we now recover from COVID-19 and the, if there's a, and the recession, we know that suicide tends to increase in times of recession. But also we know if you look at the broad issue, looking at having access to the means of suicide and media reporting, these social factors can all come into play as do these broader developmental factors and negative life events and trauma will return to stress and negative life events shortly. But what I want to focus into is, although there is all of that complexity across these different spheres of risk, to my mind, what we're all ultimately trying to understand is get some sense of where this box at the bottom is get this sense of entrapment, because to my mind, suicide is not about it's usually not about wanting to, wanting to die. Its primary driver is wanting mental pain to end. And that individuals become suicidal when they're trapped by that mental pain. And that entrapment of mental pain is a driving force that leads somebody to become suicidal. And that's when I'll return to you in a, in a couple of slides time um, when I focus in on the IMV model. And again, that's not to underplay, as I've said already, the vital and central importance, especially in high income countries of mental illness or psychopathology, because we know that it doesn't matter. There's some debate over the precise statistics, but we know that suicide usually occurs in the context of a mental illness, most commonly depression. But before I go into the sort of detail of the IMV model, I just want to just draw our attention briefly to some of the work on myths around suicide. Now, again, this is covered in detail. There's 14 myths I cover in the book. And, but the, the reason I put this slide up here today is because again, when I was writing the book, reflecting over my career over the last 25 years, I, I rem, it rem, reminded me of a talk I gave, one of the first public lectures I gave on suicide um, and, and must have been the mid 1990s. And, and, I, and the people who'd asked me to give the talk had asked me to do something about myths around suicide as well as risk factors. So I quickly cobbled together a list. And this is the list I cobbled together with some slight wording changes. But these 14 myths were the myths that I was talking about in the mid 1990s. And then fast forward, I think then it was till 2019, I then did, um, in 2019, I read, I hadn't been talking about myths in any of my sort of public lectures for a long time. And I talked about the myths again, and I put the slide up, this, a similar slide to this up. And what became evident to me was, although we have made some progress in dispelling many of the myths around suicide, um, we still a long way to go. And most, if not all of these myths persist to some degree. So I'll just take one example for the purposes of today is, Number four is asking about suicide plants the idea in someone's head. Now, again, all, all of us working in the suicide prevention field know that that is a myth. We know that asking about suicide, there's no evidence at all that it plants the idea in somebody's head, but there is evidence of the opposite, of the contrary. There is evidence that if you ask somebody whether they're suicidal, it could be the start of a life-saving conversation. It could be the start of get somebody getting the help and support that they need. And, and I'm not saying that's a solution, the be all and end all of suicide prevention, because of course it's not, but it's part of the complex puzzle of prevention. So, so again, that's a message we need to continue to get out, to get out there. So, so please, if you're concerned about somebody, a loved one, a friend, a colleague, please ask them directly whether they're suicidal. And again, one of the things that I do in the book is I try to talk about that, about how you might do that, because of course it's a difficult question. And, and again, there's other, so I'll just touch on one other factor for purposes of today, 
Number 12 is improvement in emotional state means lessened risk of suicide. And, and I suppose that, that the reason that's a myth is, I, I, the, the reality is that um, sadly, and uh, many of us working in the field will, will know this story sadly only too well, is that our, a loved one who had been say depressed seemed to be much better, their mood seemed to, seemed to have recovered in the days or weeks before they died. And so we were falsely reassured that things were going well for them, but then sadly they took their own life. And what we think is goes on there is, is if somebody is in a depressive episode and, and they're overwhelmed by pain, but in the depth of that episode, they decide on suicide as a solution to their problems, well then, then their mood may lift or seem to lift because actually they, find, they know that if all else fails, they can end their life. If everything becomes so overwhelming, they can end their life. And that concern then is as that mood lifts, that then the motivation and the cognitive capacity to plan and carry out the suicidal act, then that's, eleva that's uh, is elevated and maybe much more likely to be enacted. So, now, of course, if somebody's mood is improved because the crisis has been averted or their medication or their treatment or psychological treatment or supports or whatever it is are working, well, that, that's, that will explain the improvement. I suppose the message is it's unexplained or unexpected improvement in emotional state. And again, so that's just two I'll highlight and the others again are described in detail in the book. But I think that it is important, I think for all of us, as we, as we are now in the midst of suicide, World Suicide Prevention Week and World Suicide Prevention Day, and there'll be lots of conversations over this next week on suicide prevention that we all try as much as we can and dispel the myths around suicide. Okay, well, that brings me then to the IMV model, which I've mentioned already. So again, for the purpose of today, I'll just give you some key messages on the, with regard to the model. So what with the model I tried to do was I tried to um, assimilate what I thought was the evidence base out there into a new format, which would help us understand the emergence of suicidal thoughts and the transition from suicidal thinking to suicidal acts. So the key message for the, in the model, just very briefly is, as I've said already, is that the sense of suicidal thoughts emerged from, from feelings of defeat and humiliation, from feelings of defeat and humiliation from which you cannot escape. That sense of entrapment, you're trapped by mental pain. And the defeat and entrapment, the defeat and humiliation could further be driven by feelings of rejection, of loss, of shame. But to my mind, it's that, it's that being translated into defeat and humiliation from which you cannot escape. So entrapment is key to the emergence of suicidal thoughts. And there's a range of other factors which are outlined here, which illustrate the sort of background context or the pathway of moving through feelings of defeat through to suicidal thoughts and action. But for today, I just want to focus on that sense of entrapment for the sort of um, for the purposes of today's talk. And then the other key th message of the model is that pathway crossing the precipice from thoughts to acts of suicide. So we know, thankfully, that most people who have thoughts of suicide do not end their life and do not act on their thoughts of suicide. But what we're trying to do is better understand who's more likely to act on their thoughts. So although we can't predict with sufficient statistical precision who's most likely to die by suicide or attempt suicide, we can develop factors. And these factors, I argue, are these volitional factors, which I'll return to in a few seconds time or a few, few minutes time. They're key to understand this transition from thoughts about suicide to suicidal acts. So then just before I give you some data on that from what, some of the work we've done. So the key message thus far is, the emergence of suicidal thinking is driven by defeat and humiliation from which you feel trapped. And that's what's known as the motivational phase. And then the phase which was about the crossing the precipice from thoughts to acts is the volitional phase. And you'll see in a few slides time, the volitional phase is comprised of eight key factors according to my model. Now, if I can just give you a, few, a couple of slides of data on some of the studies that we do. So here's a study from a few years, a few years ago in which uh, many of our clinical studies, we see people in the emergency department 
soon after a suicide attempt. And in this study, we're trying to see, can we understand which are the factors which will predict future suicidal behavior in this high risk group of individuals? So within 24 hours of a suicide attempt, everybody completed the following measures on this, which I'm highlighting here now. And then we're able to track who was hospitalized again, or sadly died by suicide over the next four years. And unsurprisingly, those individuals who we saw in hospital who were more suicidal, were more depressed and more defeated and trapped, were much more likely to attempt suicide in the next four years. However, when we asked which factors were most important in the analysis, two emerged, past suicidal behavior and then levels of entrapment. So the more entrapped somebody was when we saw them in hospital, the more likely they were to attempt suicide in the next four years. So it highlights the importance, to my mind, in a clinical sample of entrapment, which is this core component of the IMV model. And indeed, in the more recent study, we looked at this in a young adult non-clinical sample. And really all this I want you to illustrate from this or take from this slide is when we try to think, predict suicidal thinking over a 12 month period, internal entrapment, internal mental pain, together with Thomas Joyner's concept of burdensomeness were the key drivers after you take into account baseline suicidal ideation and predicting future suicidal thoughts. So again, the message here is burdensomeness and entrapment are key. Entrapment and are, are key to understanding suicidal risk. So then an obvious question is, well, okay, so there's lots of other studies now really highlighting the importance of entrapment within the suicidal process. Well, the question is, well, how do we assess entrapment? If you're trying to make sense of, of suicide or suicide risk, what do we mean by entrapment? Now, we normally use the 16 item scale, which was developed by Paul Gilbert, who's famous for his self-compassion work and, and other therapies, and, 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 and his colleague, Steve Allen. Now, the 16 item version is all well and good, but if you're trying to use that in a clinical context, it's too long and too cumbersome. And so what we then did was we developed a four item version of it, just four questions. And again, without worrying about the statistics, and it's pretty clear here from this correlation, that asking four questions is almost as good questions if you're trying to assess entrapment. And indeed, if we look at which of those four questions, here are the four questions which we include in the, the entrapment scale, which again is published and available for people to download and use. But as you see, even just number three there, it's just asking someone, do they feel trapped inside themselves, being direct? Do you feel powerless? So it's more specific than hopelessness. It's a much more, and it's a much more specific, you're actually tied into, you can't get away from something or something, someone, and that someone could be yourself. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about entrapment uh, uh, at this stage, but hopefully I've illustrated its importance in the model, some data on showing that it is important in understanding suicidal risk. And then also then on how you might go about assessing it or measuring it um, in a clinical or in a research context. But I want to just talk about another factor which is really gained in importance in particular during COVID-19 and the pandemic is looking at the role of loneliness and suicide risk. And uh, one of my PhD students, Heller McClellan has been doing a lot of work on this within our group. And again, what, one of the first things that Heller did was look at that sense of loneliness in terms of a meta-analysis, trying to look at what did the research evidence tell us? And again, don't worry about the statistics in the middle, the key message then is when we did a meta-analysis and systematic review only of prospective studies, so we're trying to predict either suicidal thinking or suicide attempts over time, when we do the aggregate uh, analysis, it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that loneliness um, is a predictor both of suicidal ideation over time and of suicidal behavior. Now, what was surprising was we couldn't find any studies looking directly at loneliness and suicide. So that's a real gap in our knowledge. So we think, of course, it's going to be implicated, but if you go to the evidence, there's just such an absence of research in, in, with regard to loneliness 
and suicide risk. And, and indeed, uh, we think that depression is the mediator. In other words, so the more lonely you feel, um, that, that the effect of the loneliness uh, are, and depression are interrelated, or not interrelated, it makes you more depressed. The more lonely you are, the more depressed you become. And then the depression then is associated with suicide risk. And then in one of our studies just published, or it's just in press, actually, we looked at this in the context of the IMV model. And again, don't worry about all the details, but what I want to illustrate is we've looked at loneliness as a factor linked or, or how it might exacerbate the effects of defeat and entrapment. So entrapment, if I just focus on entrapment for a second, but we, just if we draw our attention, just this top line here with, these are people who, again, this is a non-clinical sample. These are just adults in the community. And we set, assessed levels of loneliness, levels of entrapment and levels of suicidal thinking. And what we find quite clearly is that those individuals who report high levels of loneliness and high levels of entrapment, they're much more likely to be suicidal. So again, that works within my model when we try and look at the complexity of understanding what are the factors or conditions that render entrapment much more likely to be translated into suicidal thoughts. And one of them is certainly loneliness and we know obviously from the work that Thomas Joyner has done over many years, and obviously that's belongingness and social connection being key as well. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the sort of uh, motivational phases sort or of suicidal thought stuff. I want to just bring us now for the last, um, say, uh, 10 uh, minutes to crossing the precipice and then hopefully some end with the, the stuff on supporting uh, or some of the people who are bereaved by suicide, those of us who are bereaved. So again, this is a, um, the quote, a quote from my mother I met many years ago. And it's, it starts the chapter in my book on crossing the precipice from thoughts to suicidal behavior. And again, it's, it's a heartbreaking statement, but, it, and I, but, but something I think many of us can sympathize with of why didn't we do, why, why didn't we do more? Why didn't we ask directly what could be done things differently and and it is just a heartbreaking it's just a heartbreaking quote but it really illustrates that challenge of many people may have thoughts of suicide but how do we better understand who might make that transition from thoughts to suicide attempts and that's where my volitional phase of the model comes into play so if you think back to my figure my, of my model, on the right hand bit was the volitional phase. And all I've done here is blow up that avis, the volitional phase into a much more hopefully accessible and easier to read diagram. So in essence, the argument is that if somebody is suicidal, if we're trying to understand who's more likely to move from being suicidal to engage in suicidal behavior or die by suicide, the argument is that these eight factors in the middle um, increase the likelihood that somebody will act on their thoughts. So it increases the likelihood that, the, that behavioral inaction will occur. So somebody will act on their thoughts of suicide. And in many respects, there are no real surprises. We know that people who have thoughts of suicide are much more likely to, um, if, you, if you have access to the means of suicide, you're more likely to act on your thoughts. If you're impulsive, you're more likely to act on your thoughts and so on and so forth. And again, I just want to highlight some of the data on this. So the argument is that these volitional factors are key to governing that transition from thoughts to suicidal behavior. So here's data from, from a study just to support that, that we did in Scotland of uh, people who had no suicidal history, people who thought about suicide, and then those who had attempted suicide. And what I want to just hone in on is this thoughts to attempts, people who go from suicidal thoughts to suicide attempts. And again, according to my model, what's key to differentiating thoughts to action are these volitional phase factors. So again, all we did is we just did some multivariate analyses. And again, according to my model, these volitional phase factors like entrapment and burdensomeness, they're important in the generation of ideation but they're not key to distinguish between ideation and attempts. And it's these volitional phase factors which are important. And indeed, that's what our data show in this 
large sample of uh, young adults in Scotland, people who are more impulsive were much more likely to be have attempted suicide rather than just thought about it. There's capability for suicide much higher in those who thought about or those who've attempted suicide compared to those who just thought about it. Mental imagery about dying and death, another volitional factor, much higher in those who, who act on their thoughts. And similarly, exposure, knowing somebody, in this case, knowing a friend who's died by suicide, increases the likelihood that somebody acts on their thoughts of suicide. Now, we were surprised that the factors to do with family didn't come out as significant, but we think that reflects, simply reflects the fact that this is a young adult sample and our peers are much more influential on our behavior than um, our family uh, as we move from in, uh, in, in sort of out of home, home life into young adulthood. And indeed, in other studies, we find same findings. Again, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but there, we discuss many of these in the book. So it's just another study of another sample of individuals from the United Kingdom, these sample from England, and we find people more evidence for this volitional phase. Then the last substantive piece I want to touch on is on uh, some of the work we've been doing in cortisol. So for the last few years, along with twin, my twin brother, Darrell, who um, we all saw the baby photograph at the start. So Darrell is, is a stress researcher and we've been doing lots of different studies looking at the cortisol, the stress hormone and suicide risk. And the idea being that when we encounter a stressful situation, we need to release cortisol so that we're, the body's prepared to fight or flee. So it prepares us to respond adaptively to the threat in the environment. And again, what the concern is in people who are suicidal is that when the threat happens, they, are, they don't release as much cortisol. So the cortisol is known as blunted. It's a flattened response. So it's not preparing the body as effectively to deal with threats in the environment. And we've also looked at this in the context of childhood trauma and its association with suicide risk. So, for example, we know in our studies and in loads of other studies published up and down the country is that high levels of trauma is associated with suicidal thinking and in particular suicide attempts. And indeed, if we look at this in a different way, a slightly different way in one of our studies, 80% of people who attempted suicide in one of our studies reported moderate to severe childhood trauma. And obviously experiencing childhood trauma is absolutely devastating in and of itself. But we've also shown, and again, I'm just giving you sort of flip through some of the key findings. We've also shown that it's associated with how much cortisol somebody releases when we do an experimental induction. So in our, some of our studies, we induce stress in the laboratory to see how the body responds. And all I want you to take in this slide is, what we know is that people who've attempted suicide release less cortisol when we do this stress reactivity. But, but crucially, how much trauma they told us they experienced in the past predicts how much stress, uh, sorry, how much cortisol they released in the laboratory. Really, really powerful findings in the experimental context. But we've also done it in a, in a study of, well, it's known as a diary study. Uh, we've shown that if we ask people to complete a diary over a week, over seven days, looking at um, how much stress they encounter, and then we get people to assess their cortisol, as you'll see in a second. Again, we can see the strong associations between cortisol, trauma, and, and suicide risk. So in this study, we've recruited 154 people. And again, we've got people with different suicidal histories, people who just think about suicide and those who attempt suicide. And as I've said already, we do this assessment and we do a seven day at home assessment that when you wake up in the morning, we ask people to measure your cortisol. Because there's a thing called the, the cortisol awakening response. And it's this idea that when we wake up in the morning, morning, within the first 45 minutes, we should see a peak in the amount of cortisol that the body releases. And although we don't know quite why it happens, we think it prepares us for the day, maybe to de deal with the challenges of the day. So again, in this study, we were looking to see, is the amount of cortisol as measured by this, um, the cortisol awakening response in the morning, is that associated with sort of suicide risk factors or, and so on and, 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 and trauma and the like. And again, just give you a few slides and then we'll draw to sort of some 
do stuff on this support um, people who um, those who die by suicide, and then we'll bring it to a close. So again, when we look at this with trauma, again, don't worry about all the details, but all you need to worry about here is the people who experience the most trauma are reporting the lowest cortisol in the morning when we do this diary study. And we also see this, that the cortisol, the much cortisol you release is associated with how suicidal and depressed you tell us you are one month later. So again, illustrates the complexity. And then the, the last thing I want to say in this is on, when we looked at this in terms of other re resilience factors or vulnerability factors associated with suicide and cortisol, we see there's a whole range of factors which we know are associated with suicide risk, right? We, well, re resilience protects, social perfectionism is a risk factor, worry is a risk factor, impulsivity is a risk factor, but they're all associated with cortisol and our sample of people who are suicidal. So what it illustrates, when we're trying to understand the complexity of suicide risk, we need to take into consideration these range of personality factors and other factors associated with suicide risk. And indeed, the last slide on this, and then we'll, I'll bring it um, to a close, is that basically we've also shown that this trait worry, is how much this we worry is associated, it mediates the relationship between how your suicide vulnerability and how much cortisol you release. Really powerful findings impl implicating suicide, uh, uh, these personality factors in the psychophysiology of suicide risk. Now, the last thing I want to say, talk about, and then we'll maybe have some discussion about supporting people who are vulnerable is, so what we're all trying to do is better understand this process from thoughts to action so we can develop interventions. And the interventions that we've all developed or have been developed there's a whole range of them just summarized in this last slide. These interventions, some of them are brief interventions and some of them are longer term interventions. And there's been lots of work. There's been lots of work on these, on safety planning more recently. The safety planning interventions are so, help us all work together collaboratively and compassionately to support each other. Okay, so just because I've run out of time, what I want to just end with, just so we've got time for some questions is, so what I, in the book, what I try to do is summarize all that evidence, summarize my journey, summarize our understanding of the thoughts, how suicidal thoughts emerge, how that translates, translates for some into suicidal behavior, but crucially how we all can do something, no matter how small, to support each other. And I'm keen to open it up because I didn't get a chance to do the slides on, I had two slides at the very end on supporting people who are bereaved by suicide, which is in the, the last part of my book but I'll just leave it for there so we can have time for questions. So thank you for your attention. Gosh, I wish we had another hour that you could fill, Professor O'Connor, because not only are you sharing such powerful things, but we've got some really great questions from our attendees. So I wanna share a few as we have time. So we have a few questions about um, the difference between ideators and those who have suicide attempts, what do you think is a uh, difference between someone who is an ideator and an attempter versus someone who has suicidal ideation and does not actually go on to attempt? Well, so I think that's where the volitional phase comes into its own because the volitional phase really tries to highlight those key factors. So, we, so things like um, people who are more likely to act in their thoughts are much more likely to be impulsive much more likely to know somebody who's died by suicide and much more likely to have mental imagery around dying and death, have higher levels of fearlessness about dying, as well as um, higher physical pain tolerance. And we also some evidence that they also tend to have maybe more severe mental health problems than those who don't act on their thoughts. Can I just try up? Yeah. Additionally, we have comments about those with the lived and living experience of yeah. losing family members and loved ones to suicide. And if someone is loses a parent, uh, uh, for example, to suicide, does that automatically mean or and is it inevitable that they are now at higher risk? And how might we mitigate that risk? That's a great question. I'm so glad that that was raised. So Statistically, we know that people who are bereaved by suicide are statistically at elevated risk. But it's really important to be to recognize that, of course, that's only one of many potential risk factors associated with suicide. And so 
that although it's a statistical increase in risk, is that um, a whole range of other factors have to come together to, 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 make, to mean that somebody who is exposed to suicide or is bereaved by suicide acts on their thoughts. Because the overwhelming majority of people who are exposed or bereaved by suicide never become suicidal and never act on their thoughts of suicide. So that's really important that, yes, we should always be cognizant of somebody who is at risk of suicide, who is bereaved and they get the support that they require, but it's not an inevitability. So just to reassure them that somebody, but it is a statistical risk. I think you speak again to how it's not just a single factor. And while these may be risk factors, um, that can predict what, whether suicide ideation or attempts are an outcome, they don't necessarily mean um, that the risk is all the same. I also um, wanted to share a question we had from an attendee about uh, websites that share uh, lethal means and kind of the role that might, what you might have uh, discussed in your research lab or seen about the role that those websites play in sharing information about access to lethal means? Well, so again, I think we need to be, have responsible reporting and sharing of information because um, we do know that in terms of, the, again, as part of the volitional phase, anything which increases um, the accessibility of suicidal methods increases the likelihood that somebody who's vulnerable will act on their thoughts of suicide. And so although it's very, very difficult to obviously regulate such websites, um, many of the sort of big networks and, so, uh, and Google and, and, organ and Facebook and other organizations are trying their best to ensure that those sites, if somebody searches for method that helplines come up rather than those sites themselves. It's such an important, it's so important that we do whatever we can to ensure that those sorts of um, unhelpful sites on methods are, are not, people don't find them when they're vulnerable. And that's a, even more of a, a reason to consider that it is a public health issue that is addressed through uh, collaborative public health measures to in, ensure that there's safe reporting and those, um, there are resources that are available to those that might be in that, you know, more of that volitional phase. Oh, absolutely. And I think, but I think it's really important what you highlight there, Rosie, is that recognizing that suicide prevention isn't only a mental health problem. It's a, it's a social and public health concern and priority. And part of that public health response is responsible reporting. Part of that public health response is protecting those who are most vulnerable. Part of that public health response is having a safety net in place for people who are struggling with employment or financial issues or trauma or whatever it may be. Because what you're trying to do is, when we think about suicide prevention, to my mind, there are at least two things. One is you're trying to stop people becoming suicide in the first place. So you're that motivational phase, but you're also then if somebody is suicidal, putting as much safety nets in place that people don't act on their thoughts. And that's really the part of the public health um, response as well, both for destigmatization of mental health problems, encouraging help seeking and reaching out. And, and, and yeah, so we all, I mean, I genuinely, although suicide is impossible, I mean, it's so difficult to pre prevent on an individual level, and if we look in the statistical studies, but if we can do more and more and more, we can mitigate risk in more and more people. What an excellent point to end on. Thank you so much, Professor if we're gonna end, Can I just put one last slide up then, Rosie? Please. So, yeah, the one slide, so I didn't get a chance to put this slide because I was overexcitable on my journey through suicide. Um, no, I just wanna end with, if it's okay, with the very last slide I was going to have in the talk, and it's, a, the last line of the book, and I'm hoping it is to convey a message of hope, because what I try to do with the book and what I've tried to do, I suppose, in this talk in the last 40 or so minutes is say that although we can never bring back those who we have lost, we can better support those left behind. And if we do all work together, we can save more lives. And that my ultimate hope is that as a society, if we are kinder and more compassionate, both to ourselves and to those around us, then we really will go some distance in protecting all of us from the devastation of suicide. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Professor O'Connor. Um, it's been an honor to have your presence here. So many demands on your time right now, and uh, we're just grateful that you're you were able to, to do this with us. Um, for those of you who um, want to connect with uh, Rory and his work, um, what's the be best way for people to connect? What's the uh, website maybe that they should go to? Just go to suicideresearch.info, which is our website. Thanks, Sally, and there's all information about our studies and, and, all, and how to get in touch. Great, and we put a number of links in the chat about the upcoming World Congress from the International Association of Suicide Prevention, of which uh, Rory is the president, as well as information on World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, so thanks to all of you who showed up today. If you haven't already, please join us uh, over at unitesurvivors.org. Um, we're also in all of the places around social media. We'd love to hear what you thought of today, as well as ideas you have for future conversations. Um, and next month we are looking at, this is a tentative for the moment, but we're looking at our uh, next topic being on adoption and suicide. And it will be on Tuesday, October 26th at 8 p.m. Hope to see you there. Take care, everybody. <laughs>